I'm Teresa. I'm an enthusiastic amateur field naturalist and botanist. I'm not a trained botanist, just a self-taught. I regularly lead moderately placed hikes for the Golden Age Hiking Club and also for Nature Vancouver. And I'm also a member of the Nature Vancouver Botany Section. I'm a native Vancouverite and grew up in North Vancouver, climbing trees, picking huckleberries, wading in Mosquito Creek, and playing outdoors with my six sisters. I enjoy nature of all sorts, but my special passions are plant identification, wild orchids, tide pooling, and helping people to develop what I call the art of noticing the natural world around them. Surprisingly, while I've always been fascinated by terrestrial plants, seaweeds are a relatively new passion for me. I spent most of my tide pooling trips moving them aside to look for animals like nudibranchs, anemones, and sea stars. And only in the last few years did I begin focusing my attention on these equally beautiful plants. It turns out that BC is a veritable hotspot of seaweed biodiversity. Of the 650 species of macroalgae in the Pacific Northwest, over 80% are found in BC waters. So in this presentation tonight, I'm hoping to share some of my uh, growing fascination with these plants with you. So I'm just going to share my screen now. So um, to start with, I just wanted to say that algae are marine aquatic plants, but not all marine aquatic plants are seaweeds. There are three main groups of seaweeds, the macro, three main groups of algae, the macro algae or seaweeds, flowering plants like surf grass and eelgrass, and micro algae like phytoplankton. So you can see examples of all three in this picture, surf grass, the bright green long grassy stuff, some seaweed, and also some examples of microalgae blooms. So most of us have walked along a beach at low tide and seen piles of decaying brownish seaweed rack hopping with sand fleas and smelling a bit ripe. Oops, sorry, I'm, okay. But if your main impression of seaweed is as a slimy mess. I hope to change your mind. BC's Diane Bernard, a self-proclaimed seaweed ambassador and the founder of the cosmetics firm Seaflora, likens BC's marine algae to a beautiful garden. She says, like any garden, it grows, it fruits, it reproduces, and it sloughs off. We would never judge a garden by the look, smell, or texture of a compost pile. But essentially, that's what the seaweeds on the shore are. That's the sea's compost pile. In tonight's presentation, we'll explore gardens of living seaweed and all their glorious splendor. It's mainly a slideshow, but I wanted to start with a couple of very short videos of spring seaweeds. So um, I'm just going to share um, a few seconds of each of these uh, videos. That, that's the one without sound, right? No, it's the one with sound, but it's without sound right now. So just gives you a sense of how the seaweed move and uh, undulate in the water and because we don't often get to see them alive. And then I'm just going to show you um, another, um, this is another uh, spring um, video that um, I think is really um, lovely.
So that was just to give you kind of a, a taste of what the, um, the underwater world would look like. I've never scuba dived myself, but it does give you a sense. Now I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint. Life from current sliding in the upper left corner. So as well as being uh, beautiful, seaweeds are extremely useful. In the wild, they provide critical habitat and food for fish and other marine species and protect coastlines from destructive wave action. They sequester carbon and along with microalgae, they produce most of the world's oxygen. We, we think of the rainforest as the lungs of the planet, but actually the oceans also are. Harvested seaweeds are a good source of vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, and fiber, and can make a tasty salad or snack food. In addition to sushi wraps and the carrageenan used to thicken ice cream, seaweed ingredients are also found in many other foods and dietary supplements, and are also used in the production of cosmetics, fertilizers, toothpaste, beer, wine, and industrial chemicals. Seaweeds are found in all kinds of places, including many popular lower mainland parks. Rocky shorelines usually offer more variety and the extra benefits of tide pools, but sandy, muddy, and gravel shorelines also have interesting seaweeds. A 2012 survey of Stanley Park's shoreline tallied 38 different species, half of which appear in tonight's slideshow. Piles of rack, like we saw in the previous picture, can produce interesting finds, but for a good selection of living plants, you'll need to visit at low tide. So these are some of the places around the lower mainland that um, you can uh, find seaweeds. And many of you, I'm sure, are, have visited these places, but maybe you haven't gotten close to the shoreline at low tide. While there's a great diversity of seaweeds close at hand, nothing beats a visit to the wild west coast of BC where shorelines are sub subject to direct wave action. The cold, nutrient-rich waters support a glorious array of marine algae in every imaginable shape and color. The sites listed here are all on the south to central Vancouver Island, but the Sunshine Coast, Central BC Coast, and Haida Gwaii also offer wonderful exposed and semi-exposed sites for tide pooling. This is just a little explanation of some of the, the, the terms of where seaweeds grow. The backshore zone, which is the area to the farthest left, consists of terrestrial plants that can tolerate thin soils, drying wind and salt spray. Salal, Arbutus, and shore pine are a few examples. Spray or splash zone plants are above the high tide line, but are regularly exposed to salt water from larger waves. Acorn barnacles and limpets that trap moisture in their shells can survive here, but most algae can't. The intertidal zones are where things get really interesting. They are the area between the highest high tide and the lowest low tide. There, patterns of algae growth are governed by exposure to the tide and wave impact, as well as by species interactions, such as grazing by invertebrates and competition for space and light. In the high intertidal zone, plants are regularly submerged once or twice a day, but must tolerate heat stress and drying out during long periods between high tides. Inhabitants of the mid intertidal zone spend about half their time submerged, but they also must tolerate significant periods out of water. The low intertidal plants are submerged most of the time. They are only exposed when tides are at their lowest, which may range from a few minutes to a couple of hours. The subtidal fringe residents are likely only exposed a very few times a year during extreme low or negative tides, while plants and animals in the subtidal area at the far right of the drawing um, are always submerged. That subtidal zone extends from the lowest low tide to the edge of the continental shelf, about 200 meters below sea level. But since seaweeds need light to photosynthesize, most of them can't survive below about 30 meters of depth. Um, Tides are driven by the position of the sun and the moon and by the surrounding land. 
The lowest and highest tides are called spring tides, where spring in this sense is in terms of jump as opposed to the season of the year. They occur around the full and new moons when the sun and moon align. Most coastal areas have two high tides and two low tides each day, with one pair more extreme than the others. The local mean lower low tide is defined as zero. A tide lower than this is called a minus tide. Those are the best for exploring shorelines, but the trick is to find a day with extremely low tides in daytime. For tide pooling, you want to arrive at a chosen site an hour or two before the lowest low tide so that you can follow the water down as it recedes. This gives you the maximum time to explore. The graphs at the top of the screen show how the different tides are for Port Renfrew and Vancouver are on the same days. As you can see, it says that in Vancouver, the lowest tide on that same date was seven hours later than the lowest tide in um, on the out, outer coast in Port Renfrew. And um, I've also included some of the tips for safe and ethical tide pooling. Keep an eye on the clock and the sea. Avoid stepping on living things. It's not entirely possible, but as much as possible. Look closely. Photograph rather than collecting. If you're collecting seaweeds for food, know where and how and what to trim. Carrying an umbrella can be good to cut glare and reflection in photos and make sure to keep your hands clean of sunscreen or any other kinds of creams because those can get into the water and be very detrimental to the uh, animals and plants that live there. The other thing that's very important is making sure that you have the correct tide chart for your area that you've made sure that you're, whether you're it's in uh, daylight time or standard time because those are um, very important things. It's also uh, giant waves are rare, but they do happen on all coastlines. There's a picture of one in that lower photo. So it's a good idea when everybody's uh, got their uh, heads down in the tide pools to maybe assign one person to be the lookout who can uh, give a warning if there is a large wave coming so that uh, you don't have a a tragic or at least very uncomfortable accident. Seaweeds, like terrestrial plants, algae convert light energy into chemical energy through photosynthesis. Historically, they've been grouped by the most visible characteristic, their color. The formal group names reflect this. Chlorophyta, which is the Greek for green, Rhodophyta, the Greek for red, and Phaeophyceae, the Greek the, for brown. Since they share the same basic structure, live side by side in the same places, and show similar variations within groups, you might think that all seaweeds are closely related. However, that's not the case. These three groups have been evolving separately for many millions of years. Red and green algae are related to terrestrial plants and are grouped with them in the kingdom plantae. But brown al the brown algae developed more recently. Um, and uh, even those two diverged over one and a half billion years ago. Brown algae developed more recently, but the branch which led to them split off so long ago that they're not really considered to be plants at all. Uh, in addition to color variation, red, green, and brown seaweeds exhibit an amazing array of shapes and sizes, from single-celled green sphere about one centimeter in diameter to giant kelps up to 36 meters long with huge 60 centimeter diameter holdfasts, as you see in the lower picture there. Divers have compared swimming through mature kelp groves to walking through redwood forests. Seaweeds may be thread-like filaments, fleshy crests, Leafy blades, tubes, or bushes. Some are limp and almost transparent, while the others are thick and rubbery or hard and calcified. The slides will sh showcase some of the examples of their beauty and diversity. This is the basic structure of seaweed. It consists of two main parts, the hold fast the, and the frond. 
hold flasts anchor ter like terrestrial plants, they anchor the plant, but unlike roots, they don't provide any nutrition. The stipe, um, or the, what we kind of think of as the stem, can be tiny or up to 30 meters long in some kelps. The stipes of perennial kelps lay down tree-like annual growth rings, which can be used to calculate their age. The fronds, which is kind of the, the leaf part, the stem and leaf part, can be simple braids, or they can be structures composed of blades, stipes, and gas bladder floats. Gas bladders help to keep seaweed blades up near the surface so they can get the light they need. They are most common in large seaweeds like kelp, but smaller seaweeds don't need them. Blades, like leaves, are the most varied of all. They can be thin or thick, huge or tiny, flat, ruffled or twig-like, simple, branched, smooth or textured, and some have mid-ribs and some don't. Like terrestrial plants, algae convert light energy into chemical energy through photosynthesis. But unlike terrestrial plants, seaweeds have no vascular system. So each cell has to obtain its own nutrients directly from the water and the sun. So quite different from our trees and garden plants. The sexual life cycle of seaweeds is very complex and I don't understand it and I'm not even gonna try to explain it. Seaweeds, in addition to this complex sexual reproduction can also reproduce asexually, either through fragmentation where broken off bits form new plants or by spore production. Changing, Denny. Denny, I have a problem. I'm pushing the arrow and it's not changing. Okay, there we go. We're, we seem to be on again. So um, I'm going to start with green algae. Now you've had enough background. Now we get to look at lots of beautiful pictures. We'll start with the greens. There are approximately 6,000 green algae species, mostly associated with fresh water. The main photosynthetic pigment is chlorophyll, which functions efficiently in bright conditions, shallow waters, and upper intertidal areas. Sea lettuces, like these ova, have very thin, bright green blades, only two cells thick. They can be long and narrow or fan shaped and they don't have any stipe or midrib. Sometimes they have small window holes or white patches on them. That's quite common. They tolerate a great range of temperatures and are found worldwide in all intertidal zones in rocky and sandy habitats. Dried out sea lettuce is often seen on rocks. It actually continues to photosynthesize and rehydrates when the tide rises. Some other green algae. Um, also ova, um, the, in this one, the two cell layers are separated to form a delicate tube like a long cylindrical balloon. It, this algae tolerates both high and low salinity and it's often associated with freshwater seeps or where a, a stream uh, comes down into the ocean and in, in high tide pools where there's a crystalline salt deposits. The tubes are about eight inches to 20 inches long. They're not smooth like straws, but as you can see in the photo, they're um, kind of wiggly like our intestines, um, but they're um, quite beautiful and quite easy to see along the shoreline. This is the filamentous green algae. They grow more in the mid to low intertidal. They're only one cell wide and they can be branched or unbranched. They're the seaweed that's most seaweed, most similar to freshwater algae, both to things like lowly pond scum and the famous Japanese marimo moss balls, which this green tuft looks a bit like. Green tufts form loose clumps about two inches high, which are usually attached to rocks. Hangleweed or green rope has little hooks, you can see in the picture, which tangle the filaments together in a thick rope. This is a really cool um, type of green algae. These spongy dark green seaweeds sometimes appear almost black. As the name suggests, sea staghorn has a Y-shaped branching pattern like deer's antlers. 
The branches are about half an inch to one inch in diameter, and the plants themselves can be about up to about 16 inches long. The blobby cushion form is much less elegant. Viewed under a microscope, the rough felty surface looks almost fleecy, soften. Both species like low subtitle habitats and tolerate low light locations like caverns and deeper tide pools. So you won't see them right up on the surface of rocks, but they're very cool. The next big group of algae is the brown algae. There's an estimated 1,500 to 2,000 species of brown macroalgae, and almost all of them are um, seaweeds. There's almost no freshwater species. The photosynthetic pigment, fucoxanthin, gives them their distinctive color, usually a greenish or almond brown. It absorbs different wavelengths than chlorophyll, allowing these seaweeds to survive in deeper water. Rockweeds are the most common and well-known seaweed on cold northern hemisphere coasts. Pacific rockweed is very common locally, growing on rocks from high to mid-tidal zones. It prefers sheltered to moderately wave-exposed sites. It's quite variable, but can be recognized by its narrow, many-branched blades and it has, as you can see here, it has a midrib. Um, the inflated branch tips, which the arrow is pointing to there, kind of remind me a bit of crab claws. They help keep the plant upright in the water, and when mature, they also contain the eggs and sperm. The plant sea cauliflower is another brown algae with has kind of a jelly-like texture, but I don't have a photo. Oh, there actually, there is some of it there. You can see in... In between the others, you can see this uh, the sea cauliflower. Doesn't look much like cauliflower or very tasty. You can use the mouse to select the screen there. Okay. Um, this is another kind of rockweed, Pel Pelvetiopsis. It resembles the fucus, but it's smaller. The fronds are oval in cross-section, and these ones don't have any midrib on them. It's also found on exposed rocky shorelines in the high intertidal zone, and is another one that you will see around Vancouver. Now we come to the biggest and most familiar brown algae, the kelps. The authors of Pacific Seaweed describe kelps as the powerhouse that drives the shallow water ecosystem. Their phenomenal growth introduces energy-rich food to herbivores who in turn feed local and invading carnivores, fishes, and invertebrates. Their structure provides an architecture much as trees and bushes alter the landscape, which serves as a nursery, refuge, and substrate for colonization by animals and other seaweeds. All kelps have the same basic structure, a hold fast, the stipe or stem, and a blade, but the different species vary enormously in size, shape, and texture. And even within a species, there can be a lot of variation. As uh, this photo shows, these photos show seersucker kelp, the one in this picture, um, can differ in shape and color, but it, it keeps that puckered texture and the five longitudinal ribs are visible in all the different forms. The stipe is usually about 30 centimeters long and topped by a blade up to about two meters long. Seersucker kelp is found in the lower intertidal and upper subtidal zones on the wild west coast of Vancouver Island, but also in the more sheltered waters around Stanley Park. Individuals from exposed locations are usually narrow and thick, like the picture at the top, while those in protected sites are broader and thinner, but those attractive heart-shaped ones were actually taken from a very exposed site at Batonco Beach on the west coast of Vancouver Island. At a quick glance, these two kelps could be confused since they both have glossy blades with a lovely ruffled appearance. But on closer examination, they're they're quite distinct from each other. Broad-winged kelp, the one on the left, 
has a long narrow blade with a distinct midrib and ranges from 30 centimeters to several millimeters in length. To me, it looks like bronze satin gathered onto an elastic band. The small winged reproductive blades that give it its name aren't visible in this photo. The sugar kelp on the right has broad unblanched blades, kind of remind me of elephant's ears. Instead of a midrib, the broad central panel is smooth and it's ruffled along the edges on either side. It gets its name from the sweet white powder, mannitol, that comes to the surface as the seaweed dries. Both of these beautiful species can be found growing on rocks in the low to intertidal to upper subtidal zones around Stanley Park. So again, you don't have to go far to find these ones. Like Alaria, the previous ones, this kelp produces multi-branched fronds from a single holdfast, but its shaggy fronds are very different from those smooth edged ones. Each mature frond has a long flat and central belt called a rachis, you can see in the top there, with a rough sandpapery texture. On either side of the rachis, there's a row of side appendages, a mixture of small floats and leafy blades. The floats are the yellowier ones. A large frond can be up to 15 meters long, but the more common two to three meter ones really are quite reminiscent of an elegant ostrich feather boa, as the common name is feather boa kelp. It's found on rocks in the low intertidal to upper subtidal zones and is one of my favorites. These are kelps with stipes and, and uh, simple blades. These are two perennial kelps with a sing similar structure, a relatively long rigid stipe topped by a single blade. In Lameria sechelli, the kelp on the left, each holdfast has a single blade, which is usually fairly broad up to 30 centimeters wide and often deeply split into several finger-like lobes you can see in the picture. The young blades in the main photo are narrow and unsplit. This kelp grows in exposed rocky locations and in every photo I've seen, its main companion is the bright green surf grass. Growth ring studies at UBC found that this kelp is very long lived, commonly about 12 years, but occasionally as much as tw 20 to 24 years. In the split kelp on the right, each hold fast gives rise to a dense clump of stipes, each topped by a narrow blade less than five centimeters wide. As you can see from the photo, this species is found in sandy sites in low intertidal region. This um, cool picture by Joan Lopez looks like a tropical island during a hurricane, but it's really just a rocky boulder with a grove of surf loving kelp. Sea palm has a hollow stipe about 60 centimeters long, topped with a cluster of rib blades from 20 to 40 centimeters long. It's very tough and has broad fingered, a broad fingered hold fast that lets it withstand wave velocities of up to 14 meters per second. In BC, it's only found in the high intertidal zone on the west coast of Vancouver Island. Bull kelp is a familiar site in BC. It occupies a variety of habitats and often washes ashore after storms. Its single long stipe can be over 30 meters long, topped by an onion-shaped float and a clump of long narrow blades up to four meters long. Many of us, I think, have played with these on the seashore as kids. This annual kelp is very fast growing and its blade length can increase by more than 17 centimeters per day. It grows subtitally in large groves, which provide critical resting and feeding habitat for sea otters. Unlike bull kelp, giant kelp, if you thought bull kelp was large, giant kelp, even larger, is a perennial. An individual clump can live from three to seven years, but individual fronds live only about 100 days. The average growth is about 28 centimeters per day. So it's almost a foot a day, but it can reach 60 centimeters per day in ideal conditions. 
Clumps consist of genetically identical fronds or branches arising from a common holdfast. Each branch has bladderless reproductive blades at the bottom, many blades with basal bladders up the stem and a split blade at the tip. You can see in the uh, picture on the right, you can see the, the bladders at the base of the blade. The beautiful golden brown blades have a distinctive rippled texture. Uh, makes me think of rippled sand after the tide goes out. Giant kelp is found on the Pacific coast of North and South America, as well as in South Africa, New Zealand, and Australia. But these different populations are now considered to be ecotypes of the same species. Giant kelp forms large underwater forests whose extensive canopies can be mapped by satellite. Such large canopies can modify oceanic conditions such as water movement and light penetration. Now, I've done an awful lot of talking. I'm gonna give you a, a brief break in the kelp forests of BC Central Coast, and then we'll move on to the red algae. Okay, now I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint. So red algae are the largest and most diverse group with over 7,000 currently recognized species. Only 5% are found in fresh water. Their red color comes from the pigment phycoerythrin, which absorbs blue light. Because blue light penetrates water to a greater depth than the light of longer wavelengths, these pigments allow red algae to photosynthesize and live at greater depths than most other seaweeds. The deepest seaweed ever recorded was a red encrusting coralline found at a depth of 270 meters. I can't imagine there was much light down there. While green and brown algae usually match their named colors, red algae can range from pale pink to almost black. Some intertidal rhodophytes have very little phycoerythrin, and many appear yellow green, coppery brown, or bluish from chlorophyll and other pigments also present in them. Like tide pools, mini caverns under low intertidal overhangs are great places to investigate red seaweeds. Because they're more protected from waves and drying out, they can support a great variety of species, both plants and animals. The little grotto in this photo is only about 18 inches long, but it probably has nine or 10 different algae species when you start looking closely. So there, these are all the Algae here are relatively small seaweeds found in low intertidal or shallow subtidal areas. So these examples include veined, ribbed, and simple blades. See simple blade at the bottom and a um, veined one at the top. The veins aren't very apparent. And then this one with the strong rib. Note the fine veins and iridescence in the seaweed at the top left. The calliophytus at the lower left is part of a very complex and varied group. Brigitte, who provided this photo and uh, is also one of the main authors of the uh, BC Seaweeds book, did her um, PhD thesis on them. And she wrote, hundreds of plants were sorted into genetic groups based on DNA similarity. And many, many hours were spent measuring plants in the search for physical features that would be diagnostic for each species. Alas, for most species, it was not to be. 
So I guess sometimes that's <clears throat> how your PhD thesis works out. So this is the wonderful Mazella, the rainbow iridescent seaweed. There are 15 species of Mazella in BC, but the one shown is the most common. Its large, colorful blades with the iridescent sheen are unforgettable on a bright, sunny day. A gentle tug will reveal the stretchy, elastic quality typical of all red algae. Iridescent seaweed is found from low intertidal to subtidal zones in relatively wave-sheltered areas, but it is also found common on the west coast of Vancouver Island, just not right on a very rough point. This is another kind of um, very important kind of red algae. This seaweed group with the very thin, simple blades includes nori and laver. And the seaweeds in that group are found around the world in intertidal zones and shallow waters. The blades, which can be up to a meter long, are only one or two cells thick, making them almost transparent, as you can see in the picture. Their color ranges from pale creamy yellow to deep brown, red, or even purple. These seaweeds are rich in minerals, particularly iodine and iron. The high, high iodine content gives the seaweed a distinctive flavor in common with foods like olives and oysters. Used for sushi and other Japanese dishes, farmed nori is a multi-million, multi-billion dollar industry, currently the single greatest aquaculture enterprise in the world. But Japan is not the only place where these kind of seaweeds are appreciated. In Britain, cultivation of laver seaweed as food is thought to be very ancient. In Welsh, Wales, it is traditionally picked, washed, and boiled for hours to form a thick green mush known as laver bread. Mm. <laughs> Local First Nations also um, used uh, this group of seaweeds. Ethnobotanist Nancy Turner found that Porphyra was nutritionally and culturally important to many coastal First Nation peoples in BC. It's still harvested from wild populations in large quantities, served in a variety of ways, toasted as a snack, cooked with clams, salmon eggs, or fish in soup, or sprinkled on other foods as a condiment. It's also a valued trade and gift item, especially on the central and northern coasts of BC and Alaska. Common linguistic origin of the majority of names for this species among some 16 language groups and five language families indicates widespread exchange of knowledge about this seaweed. So uh, not just among the, the coastal tribes. So also another very fascinating and this I just thought was a nice picture showing a variety of soft and hard red algae in one small area so you can see uh, the encrusting coral lines the the pinky ones here here you can see some more branched uh leafy coral lines like kind of like a leafy lichen crusting phase of the turkish washcloth a smoother leafy phase um a black larch uh another red seaweed that has little knee, knee, needles like a larch tree a uh, bumpy phase of the Turkish washcloth and just a, a huge variety in, in only a, a square foot or so of, of space. So um, these are some of the other, a closer look at some of those encrusting uh, coralline algae. Coralline, which means coral-like, red seaweeds come in both branched, articulated, and hard crust-like forms. Their hard rock-like texture is a result of impregnating their cells with calcium carbonate, a protection against grazing mollusks. Both forms are very common in tide pools and their beautiful pinkish colors are very eye-catching. Dead specimens are pure white, like the one in the picture at the bottom. Crustose corallines are often seen on rocks, but you also see them growing on barnacles, mussels, and other shells, both dead and alive. The texture can be rough and lichen-y or smooth and glossy with kind of pimply bumps like you can see in that one picture. To survive wave action, branched corallines have flexible joints between their hard segments, kind of like knights with armor. 
They come in many beautiful forms from dense and leafy to open and fern-like. The dead branch in the photo is a variety called bead coral. Very beautiful. So these two seaweeds, Turkish washcloth and Turkish towel, <laughs> both occur in leafy and crust forms. For many years, the alternating leafy and crustose forms of the mastocarpus were thought to be two separate species. Even the lethal, leafy forms of uh, mastocarpus papillatus, the Turkish washcloth, are extremely variable in color and shape. The species name papillatus means bumpy. Turkish towel blades are unbranched and can be up to 30 inches long, but they're usually less than 12 inches. As you'd expect, the washcloths are usually smaller than the towels, oh, less than six inches. In some places, these seaweeds are apparently used like a loofah to remove dead skin when bathing. Strangely enough, the Turkish cotton towels these seaweeds are named after aren't actually a nubbly terry cloth texture like our towels, but a flat cotton weave more like our dish towels. And here's again, this is a, an interesting red algae that doesn't look red at all. Another common name for these water-filled sacks, sea sacks is dead man's fingers. From two to eight inches long, they're found on rocks in mid to low intertidal areas. Color can range from greenish yellow like these ones to orange and deep red. The cylindrical shape with its reduced surface may offer protection against drying out similar to cacti on land who have kind of similar shaped um, leaves. So. Sorry, I'm just gonna. These are among my most uh, favorite of the red algae. These delicate beauty is also found in the lower intertidal and shallow subtidal areas. A clump of paired branches can reach 12 inches long and the color can range from dark red to light pinkish. Asplenium is a kind of fern, so their uh, Latin name means a uh, fern-like. And here's just some oddball miscellaneous ones of non-leafy and non-coralline red algae. Holly, the one at the top, um, is a filamentous dark brownish red algae with slender cylindrical thread-like branches, less than 0.2 millimeters in diameter. The bushy radial branching pattern gives it kind of a shaggy appearance. Rusty rock, is one of many soft red crusted algae. It's bright to rusty red and forms a very thin coating on intertidal rocks and pebbles and tide pools. So these rocks here are only about an inch across. Constantinia is a thick leathery algae with a stipe in the middle of the blade. The one in the photo looks more like a, to me, like a wide shallow stemmed candy dish, but um, there are sometimes, uh, two tiers of blades, which gives more of a cup and saucer effect than this one has. But again, a, a very uh, interesting uh, seaweed and one I'm gonna be keeping an eye out for. So to finish, here is a beautiful intertidal seaweed garden near Port Renfrew on Vancouver Island and an underwater peak at dancing subtidal seaweeds just to finish off.
I just love watching the way they move in the currents. It's so amazingly beautiful to watch. But even when you're seeing them in a tide pool, you're really not seeing the, the wonderful grace of the living plants. So that's it for my presentation. This is just some information on the um, resources that I used in um, putting this together. I'm not a, a seaweed expert, so I did a lot of um, looking things up and talking to people and getting um, information on uh, seaweeds. So I hope I've managed to share some of my fascination with them. and. Um, maybe get some people who haven't previously considered seaweeds as something worth looking at to uh, take a closer look.